if you do it yourself, you can make sure it's good architecture. And then you get more projects from it. Um, I just don't know any other way to do this. Episode 25. Let's do this. This is the business of architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. Welcome back, Architectos. This is Enoch, and Business of Architecture is the show where we talk about making more money as an architect so you can forget about paying the bills and focus on doing what you love. Today is part two of our interview with Heather Johnston, architect, located in sunny La Jolla, California. Heather just finished what many architects dream of doing, myself included, building their own home. In this episode, we talk about how she got the funds to build her home the challenges she had designing and getting it built, and why she chose modular construction. So without further ado, here's today's show. So you've positioned yourself to, uh, as, as someone who does uh, modern design, and you've been able to get some of those projects. And how long have you been doing this in, uh, in La Jolla? Well, let's see, we moved to La Jolla in 1998, so what's that, 15 years? Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's let's switch over now and let's talk about your um your the home that you are now living in. Um that was something that that caught my eye when you emailed me because it's a, it's a gorgeous home and we're going to go ahead and slice in some vi some video into this video and show some pictures of what you've done. But in a nutshell for our listeners, you have you've built your own home with your husband which you are now in in this video, right? Is that your home in the background? That's, that's right, yeah. Okay. Tell me about the process. Um, what First of all, what made you decide to, to build your own home? You know, uh, you know, we built our home before. We built, uh, when we were living on Salt Spring Island in uh, the west coast of Canada, we built our own, our own place there also. And uh, for every reason imaginable, just to, uh, once again, once again, get my chops. Um, and, uh, work through some builders so I can check them out for other projects and to test ideas that clients wouldn't go for. It's hard to convince a client to do something they've never heard of. And it basically is a lab for myself to test ideas. And then also you've got something great to show people. Um, it gives There's a certain way to establish bona fides with that. Okay. Well, tell us about the house because we're not there. We can't walk through it. Describe it to us um, with your words so we can get a sense for what the house is like design-wise. Well, design-wise, you know, Enoch, the whole modular process did some dictating of what we could and couldn't do. But to me, I saw it as a challenge because basically we've got rectangles of a certain size, 14 feet 9 wide, 60 feet long. And um, that, in a way, that's our premise. And so uh, that was fine. And it still is because what it allowed us to do was to keep a very simple floor plan that accommodated uh, all the functions, living, sleeping, entertaining, outdoors, uh, in a fundamentally uh, simple plan. Okay. Now I'm pulling so, up the plan here and I will, I will splice into the video. But walk me through the plan a little bit and tell me about some of the challenges you had with that particular dimension of 9 feet wide by 60 feet long. It's 14 feet 9 inches. Sorry, thanks. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, sometimes it works great, but other things like a living room or even a master bedroom, that's a little tight. So we had to combine some modules together, and other times we had to just uh, make do. For instance, we've got a master bedroom that's 14 feet 9 wide, which is yeah, it's not overly generous, not for down here anyway. For a lot of parts of the country, it's perfect, but for California in this area, they like big master bedrooms. So what we did was we put all the functions like the master closet and everything we could outside of that 14.9 so that there's simply the bed in that area. If it's full of windows, so we look out onto the courtyard and we can see there's a reflecting pool there and some lovely grasses planted. Um, so that that actually was probably the only restriction was the size um, in terms of accepted or expected sizes here in California of what a you know master bedroom size could be. We could have put two modules together, but 
No, I, I, I chose to work the other way, and that's accommodate just a bed in 14 feet 9. Gotcha. Okay. Why modular? Tell me about the process of deciding that. <laughs> that's a great question, because I want, I'm curious, and um, modular has just gotten so much press in the last 10 years, and to me, it seemed also a great way to be able to control the process. In other words, I wouldn't have, okay, or even, I'll back up even a little more. In the 25 years I've been doing this, it's these questions from every client. Why is this taking so long and costing so much? Boom, that's it. And um, the projects we've done for ourselves, you know, we built the house I told you about before, and any kind of remodels, kitchen additions. I started asking, why is this taking so long and costing so much? And I really wanted to answer those questions and to see if I could do it better. And I thought modular could potentially offer me a way around those two big questions that in the end scares the, the daylights out of anybody wanting to build. And, you know, there's always this, you know, with any client, there's this process that happens. And then about two-thirds of the way through, you get this meeting where everybody sits down and you hear, why is this tap? Why is this taking so long and costing so much? Well, Heather, and what was the answer to that? Uh, the reason it's taking so long is because I would say the architect potentially, and not always, can lose control to the contractor who um, doesn't have the same agenda. Um, I was asking myself that question for my own projects. and which is crazy. I thought, I'm the architect. I'm supposed to have all these answers, and yet these clients um, are asking the same questions I'm asking. So I, I thought, well, how can I improve on um, at least the answers to those questions and give them a better one? And uh, I found out uh, the reason it costs so much is because the contractor is has a different agenda. And he's not as interested as you are in uh, delivering what the architect promised. And what the architect often promises is, oh yes, we can do this for X square foot. And then the contractor who, once again, hasn't seen all the drawings um, as you have them, uh, because you're still doing them quite often, and he gives the price um, that is one that wants to get the job, not as, not that's necessarily a realistic one. And um, the architect, um, you know, is, is caught backpedaling during the process. Um, not not always, but then secondly, the reason it's taking so long too is because um, clients take a, take a long time to make decisions. How could they know right off? They're not professionals. They don't deal with this for years like we do. Uh, so in the end, I would say the reason it costs so much and takes so long is because of the contractor and the client. Classic. So you turn to modular construction and. What did you discover about that process? Is that an answer? What answers did you find going with the modular solution? Oh, it was so interesting. Uh, yeah, I found that, it. yeah, the, um, the modular process is fundamentally the way to go for the future. I am absolutely convinced. There's a lot of um, kinks to work out, and I would say one of the main kinks to work out, at least in our situation, is the delivery of the modules and the set and the handoff to the guys on the site at our end, because we found that uh, these were out-of-state builders, uh, modul modular builders, and they arrived and delivered the modules, and they stitched them together, and then they left. And what happened was, um, not having any buy-in to the final project, uh, we, by the way, accepted the modules to drywall ready. I mean, they had drywall in them, up to drywall, and then we added the finishes, like the kitchen and the tile and the wood and, um, you know, the railings. Um, it came with the windows and the drywall, and that helped in the shipping, of course. It made it, you know, structurally able to lift them. They built it entirely in the factory, and then they took it apart, put it on big rigs, shipped it across two states, delivered it over two days, which is amazing. It's still impressive. We had, um, you know, television cameras were here. The neighbors were all here. It's very exciting. Uh, day one. We uh, have had um, our, our pictures taken standing around the footings. You can see the footings uh, um, being made in our little video. And then at the end of day two, we were standing on our second floor looking out at our fabulous view in two days. That's so amazing. Um, then we finished it over four months with the finishes I mentioned, including stucco and so on. 
and then we moved in in December. It was delivered in August. I mean, what's that's amazing. Okay, but how did we get there? Uh, oh, it was the hardest thing I've ever done. And I'll go back to what I was saying because uh, once the see the modular guys because they live out of state. All they want to do is get done and get home. It's hugely expensive for them to be here on the job site, you know, making things right. Uh, so, you know, we'd had guys that would drive in on a Friday night and they'd try and get everything done, but by heck and high water, they were going to be out of here and be home by Sunday. Uh, so we had our Finnish guys come in and they were, holy moly, they couldn't believe, uh, there was nothing they didn't have to fix before doing their part. So part of that thing is, is um, how do you marry an out of, uh, say, even county modular builder with um, final finishes? Now, one could say, well, why didn't you have the modules delivered with all the final fi finishes? Well, another thing we were trying to do, Enoch, was build a fairly high-end custom home and custom house. And what I wanted to do was use a lot of the connections that we've made over the years, all the tile people we've come to know and love, and all the, you know, wood providers and stucco guys. We've worked with these guys on other projects. We wanted them on our project. There's also other reasons for that. But um, so that's why we decided to get it delivered up to the drywall, and then our guys would come in and finish it. And secondly, these beautiful, we've got some really lovely Italian tile. It would never have survived that kind of manhandling. You know, these things are crane once, twice, three times. So it was in that way, um, it was very interesting exper experiment. And, on, and finally, um, most modular home builders um, that we that we were looking at anyway, which were you know the um, guys that have been around for thirty years and used to doing it a certain way, uh, made huge markups on any kind of finish that wasn't you know basically uh, American standard uh, toilets or anything. Like we have all wall hung totos. That was like, whoa, huge markup for that. So we said, wait a sec, let's just cut out all these high-end finishes. We'll take care of them myself. I can take advantage of all the discounts and, well, not discounts, but all the, the great prices my guys would give me for the finished stuff, including labor. And and then that way we're not going to suffer all these huge markups um, you know, from the modular builders. So that's why we did it that way. But it was also um, um, and a really interesting, and I, and I haven't yet, talk to a modular builder who's been able to answer that whole thing of, well, what's your buy-in to making sure you deliver a square and sound product? How many how many modular builders did you shop before deciding on the one you went with? Oh, I say that's a uh, it's, I'd say about five, five different ones. And the one the ones we chose we ended up going with because they've been doing this for so long. And uh, not that there um, weren't other capable people, but and also, we were on a bit of a time squeeze by then because we'd moved out and um, the economy was at such a point, it was a great time to build. So we had to make some fast decisions on who to Is, use. Was it, was it challenging at all to find a modular builder that did modern homes? It was. Uh, it was, simply because we've got some really long spans, um, you know, for all this glass because of where we are and what modern is all about. That um, there's Zeta Homes, for instance, said, you know, I love your design, but we love your design, but those spans scare us. Um, they said, why haven't you done this as a moment frame house? And I, I said, uh, well, that's the next house. <laughs> a steel moment frame would have been much more um, capable of uh, carrying these spans that we have here in this place, um, rather than the wood construction. We've got steel in it, you know, for some of them, but. Uh, you know, so some of them were actually quite honest with us and said, no, these designs really aren't up our alley, but, you know, keep in touch. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and um, how many how many did you eventually decide to choose between that said they could do it? I mean, what was the choice two. like? Yeah, we were down to two. Okay. And then we started to get prices in. And um, the second company that we were looking at and who we actually preferred personally, we just felt more in, in sync with, they just were running behind because this project was different than anyone they had ever done, and they were just running behind. Uh, true, it was around the holidays too, December, uh, getting their numbers to us, and uh, they just had reams and reams of questions. The thing is, good, that's what they're supposed to do. Then we could have gotten a realistic price, but we thought, oh, here's these other guys who are back at us. Oh, we can take care of all this. We're good, and so we ended up going with them. Okay, all right. That's 
yeah so and we'll we can talk a little bit more about that that process um, i'm looking at the floor plan here and what we'll do just for those of uh, those who are listening heather because not all people can see the video is um, we'll invite them to come look at the video because we'll be splicing in the time lapse photo while this was being constructed you had commissioned some time lapse photography tell me how that worked out because that's an amazing photo how what did it take to set that up well actually uh, we've got a a great friend who lives um, just on the street and he works for um, Scripps Oceanography and he walks past the site every day on his way to work and um, we exchanged uh, free barbecues for uh, time lapse photography which he he stuck the cameras on the palm trees that you can see there every morning on his way to work at about six. A guy showed up and uh, he just did this out of um, wonderful, generous guy, uh, Dale Stokes, Dr. Dale Stokes. And he's um, um, he's got free bar barbecues for life. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, um, the actual footage of the delivery and set is... Um, uh, taken by Aaron Feinbach, uh, photography in Santa Barbara. He came down and he did a fantastic job. We've got also reams of interview. We interviewed everybody who had a part in the process. And once we have the funds, we'll put together um, an even larger video of uh, the whole process. Because that's something also that I wanted to communicate to the community at large is what it takes to get a building done is incredible. It's not just a bunch of bunch of guys and you know they look at some drawings. It's it's, it's amazing. Um, everyone from the neighbors signing off on the project in the first place, which was very extensive, to we had to have um, archaeologists, NAMs and ARCs, the Native American monitors and the archaeologists look at every square foot of our one-third acre to make sure there was no artifacts here because, well, you know, it's a beautiful place um, here and we're not the first ones to think it's beautiful. It's people have been living here for thousands of years and have left things behind. So we had to have a whole archaeological survey, and um, getting permits for this was huge. So the people who helped facilitate those permits, and then from there, all the monitors, and then, you know, the guys showing up to do the concrete digging, and our, our tile people. Um, it, it was just, so I wanted to communicate that at, uh, to the world at large that, uh, you know, building's a really amazing thing, and it employs so many people who really do care. You are now. Are you within the coastal zone? It looks like you are. Absolutely, I'll say we are. Yeah. So you had to go through the because uh, there's a there's a law for those who don't know about about building within a certain distance on the California coast. It's very stringent in terms of what you can and can't do. How how did that make the process difficult, Heather, dealing with those constraints? Well, to be honest, three years and um, what was it about forty? Gosh, three years and uh, forty thousand dollars. And that's been environmental studies. And that's not my done. yeah. That that's not my um, that doesn't include any of my fees. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah, that's right. And also, we're because we're between what's called the first public right of way and the ocean. We it's not it's an appealable zone, so people could do appeals. And I had to go around to all my neighbors. Plus, we had a another subgroup here. It's called Scripps Estates Associates, who, as part of this this development, we own a canyon, and so. We had to make sure every neighbor signed off on this and they all voted. And then we had to go to the other planning group. And um, yeah, I redesigned the place a couple times. Wow. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I, it's one of those things where ignorance is bliss because had I known, I wouldn't have touched it. But <laughs> <laughs> well, what can you do? Yeah, but you're there and it's done. Was, <laughs> yeah. Did you find there was a lot of negative um, opposition to what you guys were trying to do there? Well, yes and no. Um, I would say no, not really. It, it's just the process is huge. And um, if we had been, um, you know, very, very wealthy people, we could have just thrown lawsuits at everybody. But since we, we had to do it the old-fashioned way, uh, which was just go talk to people. I went to all my neighbors, rolled out my plans, and uh, eventually the whole neighborhood, you know, wrote a letter supporting the project to um, the La Jolla Community Planning Group, uh, which turned us down twice. We were passed the third time because they didn't like various things, and then they turned us down because they didn't know if they wanted to see a butterfly roof in La Jolla. And, I was about to ask. <laughs> yeah. Very interesting. But I got support actually from another wonderful architect who happened to be on the planning group, and she, just in the next block, had designed a butterfly roof that didn't phase anybody, so she was able to support the project. Wonderful. 
what do the neighboring homes look like? Give us an idea of the architectural vocabulary of the neighborhood you're in. Oh, it's um, a neighborhood of just bungalows, very small scale. So I will say my house does stand out. It's two stories, and most, there's, most houses around here aren't two stories, and if they are, they're, um, uh, they're not showy. I would say in some ways this is considered showy here, um, but it's a fabulous site, and it, it deserves a project that um, you know takes advantage of it because we've got great views from the second floor. How crazy would it be not to take advantage of that? But um, most houses in this area are not allowed two stories because um, there's caveats on all the um, uh, CC and R's for the other homeowners. Um, but we're right by a very busy road, um, so it's you know we're considered a buffer. I'll okay. be okay. So it sounds like your answer to the question of this is taking too long is you did find that the modular home was was quicker. Very much so. Look at it this way, um, Enoch. While we were digging the, uh, let's see, demo deconstruction, actually, we repurposed all the building materials. Uh, there's companies that take them to Mexico. That started on April 1st, and they started in the factory in the other state at the same time. So we were digging footings, and uh, I was finishing up getting all my permits, and they were building the house at the same time. Now, how that's incredibly efficient. How can you beat that? And then by the time our footings were ready, uh, boom, they could deliver the house. I mean, think of that. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's pretty remarkable. What about what about the cost aspect of it? The costing too much. Costing too much. Well, I know what everything costs down to the penny. We built the whole house for two hundred and fifty-six dollars a square foot, and for this part of the country, to find anything under three hundred a square foot is amazing. Um, that does not include my fees, but that includes all the permitting, all the entitlements, and um, yeah, that's pretty good. That's amazing. And this is, um, I would say, we we didn't skimp. All the you know all the appliances in the kitchen are top end and great Italian tile. And um, what can I say? Uh, we've got Fleetwood windows and doors, beautiful um, aluminum, double glazed, commercial grade product. Uh, so. Now you know how hard I worked. <laughs> I paid oh. cash to all the guys at the end of every week so they would come to my job and not to someone else's. And uh, I turned wow. into a different per person throughout all this. Wow. Yeah. What's your, if you had one takeaway from the process of going through this, what is the one takeaway that you learned from all this? You know, the takeaway you know, is, is still that one I mentioned earlier, is that you have to be there and you have to know it as well as they do because in the end you're the only one that's really going to care. No matter how great the guys are, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I got to leave early today. You know, oh, I got to go pick up my wife. Or, you know, there's a certain amount of latitude you got to allow for that. They're human beings, but after, in the end, I mean, I'd be there on the weekend getting something done if I if it was mine. And they're like, oh, yeah, well, it's a long weekend. Unless it's yours, you don't bring the same kind of, you know, passion to it. So you've got to realize that, and so just be on top of it yourself. Okay. How do you think this house will affect you as a calling card, as an architect? Um, you know what? I don't care <laughs> because I'm going to be doing my own projects. And um, what there is the um, credibility I know how with other investors. And uh, as a matter of fact, I've had a couple of people through who have said point blank, I love this. If you're looking for investors, if you don't already have them, I'm on board. And then actually I had some people by yesterday who said, do you want some partners? But, wow, you know, and and that's what is so um, good architecture sells, and if you do it yourself, you can make sure it's good architecture, and then you get more projects from it. Um, I just don't know any other way to do this that makes sense. Um, there's first of all, there's um, my last project uh, for a client turned out very turned out beautifully, but there was a time during it that I thought, oh my gosh, am I going to get sued here, and the contractor, we were on different pages, um, and it was a struggle, struggle, struggle. And I realize now after doing my house, oh, yeah, it was, a, it was very, very difficult. But nonetheless, I was always in charge. And I never felt that, oh, my gosh, they're going to make the wrong decision because, you know, they all came back to us. Excellent. So it sounds like your house, in terms of being a calling card, it maybe was a calling card, but not so much for your services as an architect, 
as your services of being a partner and being able to go out there. Are you planning on developing your own projects? What's Absolutely, Eric. Um, you know, uh, no doubt about it. That's, that's the only way to do it. And um, I just kind of have the bug now of being in control. I like it. <laughs> I love that. I love the smile on your face, Heather, and I well, hope everyone yeah, can see that. Well, yeah, I know that there, there's a lot of people you've been talking to. You know, I've been I've been following your videos, and everybody's saying that. And I think that it's it's a new world for architects. Things have been so hard for these these past few years, and architects are amazing. Well, not me particularly, but in general, um, architects can think in so many creative ways, and they're so so smart. And to Put those kind of skills at the service of a client who may or may not complain about your fees or may or may not, you know, uh, decide that the contractor's right or may or may not appreciate you. I'm thinking, why give them that opportunity to not appreciate you? Agreed. Fascinating. So do you have an idea of the timeline of your first project? Do you have, already have something you're looking at? Yeah, I've got a, I just formed my LLC and um um I'm gonna be starting to look for look for some property. But I one thing I did need to mention is that this was pretty exhausting so I've taken part of the summer off you know to get the beauty shots for the place and put together the video and um, just kind of cool my heels and think okay um, this is a really great position to be in and now now how do I be smart about the next step okay well Heather is there any question that I maybe should have asked you about this process of building your modular home that you think I've left out that's important for other people to know about that will help them yeah, I, I think um, there's a few things worth mentioning, and that is um, about architecture in general and, and residential architecture in specifically. And that is there's some principles at play here in building this house that are very appealing. And um, and that's recognizing the times we're in. And the word green, um, I don't use that anymore. It's like, of course it's green. Or if you're an architect of any, you know, conscience, you've been building green for years. Um, so. I think it's important to build houses that are um, able to offer more than what you see all the building building plans offer. Um, things like does it have cross ventilation? Of course, it has cross ventilation. We don't have air conditioning installed here. We don't need it. It's been so hot this summer, but there's been beautiful bleak breezes blowing through. All the fundamentals of good architecture still apply. Starting with the siding, is it sited well? Is there a good light? Is there good air? How's the flow when you walk through? All these things have to be important. This house also is um, uh, universally accessible. All the thresholds are rollover. All the openings are generous. Um, and uh, the shower, for instance, is a roll in. There's no curbs. There's no barriers. And one of the things we wanted to do with this house is recognize that, hey, it could happen to any of us anytime. Or, you know, suddenly grandma has to come live with us and she's not very mobile. Or we've got a son that's coming back from, you know, overseas and needs some help. Um, and also, maybe we don't want to keep moving when our family grows. So I think it's important that when we design stuff that we realize what the current issues are and also what the ones coming up in the future are, like expanding lifestyles. This, this whole space here, and some of it you can see behind me, it's an office right now, but it's the whole second floor, easily dividable up into separate areas. Um, so, you know, Beauty shots are important, and it's really great to get the word out because let's face it, that's how most people see architecture, it's through photographs. They're not going to be able to come here and walk through the house, so another piece of advice, I guess, if, you're, if anyone's asking for advice, is get absolutely the best photographs you possibly can because that's the only way most people are ever going to see what you're doing. So don't skimp on that. Um, that's very important, those beauty shots, I call them that. Uh, but also, the house has to work. It has to be beautiful. It has to be glorious, and um, it has to, you know, show a passion for living in a house that you know residential architects need to show, because that's what they do, and it has to show a deeper knowledge and understanding of what living is all about. Every day you get up, it has to be great. You have to find new things when you look out the window. I mean, those are those are big goals, but that's that's what we that's what we're shooting for. Well, there is one other thing, Heather, I just wanted to touch on, and that's a little bit about the financial considerations of building your own home. You know, I just want to um, get an idea for what it takes to go through that process of coming up with the money to do your own home, especially one like yours that obviously has a substantial timeline and cost going down with it. Um, can you speak a little bit about about the idea of what, what it takes 
financially to do something like that? Um, what did it take? Well, it took um, the sale of another house um, in, in our case. And we, once again, we were incredibly lucky. Um, in 2010, uh, in July, the worst time of all the market, a neighbor came up to us and said, uh, we're looking for a house around here. And someone said, your house might be for sale. Can we buy it? And so we made a cash offer. I mean, he made us a cash offer via Skype. They lived in Boston. He was a professor, just got a new job at, at Scripps. And he would spent a lot of time driving around all the tracks. San Diego has a lot of pretty grim tracks further east. And um, he just loved our house. So I guess what lesson can be taken from that is start small but make it great and sell it. And then build some more, make it great, then sell it. And that's pretty much how we ended up financing, you know, doing this project because um, we sold the other house in uh, the height of the recession, um, nothing was moving, and we got a guy actually without an agent walking in and saying, I love your house. Can we buy it? I mean, it's crazy. <laughs> and the only reason that happens is because architecture sells. So always have confidence. If you build something beautiful, it's going to blow everything else out of the water and sell first. Love it. Love it. Absolutely love it, Heather. Thank you for those parting words of advice. And it's been wonderful having you on the show today. Oh, likewise. Thanks, Enoch. And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you as an architect can raise your fees, land the projects you love to work on, and get the time in your day back, join the members-only Business of Architecture Insider list for free by going to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash free. Enter your best email address there and I will send you instant access to free resources including my book, Social Media for Architects. If you'd like to discuss a thought or insight from today's show, visit businessofarchitecture.com slash podcast. On that page, you'll also find my notes from today's show and the action items I took away from our conversation. Until next week, keep rocking and go conquer the world. views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help architects conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.